Assalamu alaikum. You're listening to the New Beginnings podcast. No fluff, no holding back. Just honest conversations about your journey as a new Muslim. Brought to you by New Beginnings, a platform that aims to support new Muslims on their journey through Islam from the Shahada and beyond. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to all our listeners. This is the New Beginnings podcast. I'm Amanda, and as always, I'm here with our co host, Sheikh Bilal Brown. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you for joining us again. In this episode, we're going to be discussing a topic that seems to be overlooked in many circles, which is how to raise Muslim children as a convert to Islam. Obviously, of all of the challenges converts to Islam may face, raising children as Muslims is a huge one. This topic is really close to my heart, not only because I'm a mom, of course, but also because I wrote my master's dissertation about this topic back in 2016. Uh, And today we welcome our sister, Lauren Booth, who's joining us all the way from Turkey. Assalamu alaikum, Lauren. Wa alaikum salam, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh from Istanbul. And um, I must say, big greeting to you, Sheikh Bilal, and everybody listening. It's Turkey. Oh, yeah. No longer Turkey, please. Turkey. Okay. Uh, uh, wait, am I saying it right? I don't even know how to pronounce it properly. I think just do your best, but just Turkeya. don't. Tur- Turkey. Yeah. Turkey. Okay. Yeah. Turkey. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. So I think it would be good before we start on our personal discussion to lay the groundwork by understanding what the status of children whose parents convert to Islam is in the religious sense. And I'm saying this because we often hear that if someone converts their existing children automatically, and I'm putting automatically in quotes, automatically are considered Muslim. But of course, we know it's not that black and white. Sheikh Bilal, what are the rulings on this? Could you explain to us? Um, So the rulings that are mentioned in uh, Islamic legal texts, they are really related to um, court situations and law of the land and jurisprudence that uh, they say that, you know, if the the parent is a Muslim, then the child will be be a Muslim as well for legal purposes. Uh, But of course, we know that once the child reaches the age of discernment or age of puberty, whether they have been brought up in Muslim families already or they are children of converts, they have a choice to make. They have a conscious choice to make whether to follow the religion or not follow the religion. So, the, you know, the reality might be, be slightly different. And of course, if many of us are living in non-Muslim countries, then um, that legal aspect doesn't really have, you know, huge influence so all of us, you know, are here are converts, but we may not have experience of raising children in, in Islam. And that's what we, we want to talk about. I think all of us here, so we're all converts, Lauren and Sheikh Bilal and myself, we all are. Are we all parents? Yep. I am. Lauren? Yeah, I have two daughters, alhamdulillah. Okay, mashallah. And Sister Lauren, I know from previous conversations, you converted to Islam after having your children. So how did you approach their religious upbringing? So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, first thing to notice, I think, um, and I'm sure some of you listening, inshallah, will understand this, is the suddenness of the change, right? Because the shahada lands on you. It lands in your heart and it lands in your household and it lands on your household, subhanAllah. And we, and because our hearts are so freshened, and revived, we really want to hit the ground running. So I don't know about you guys out there, but subhanAllah, I had, my daughters were eight and 10. I did have a little discussion before taking my shahada. They knew I loved Muslims. They knew that, that, that these were amazing people. They knew that I'd been to Palestine and they knew they were Christian kids because we used to go to church every Sunday. So we talked a lot about God. And I said, what if God is, God is one, right? Not three. And they're like, we know that. And I'm like, okay, well, that's what Islam says. They're like, okay. And so um, they, I prepared the ground, but I wasn't prepared. And so, yes, we talked about it in theory, but then the practical comes. And uh, by the grace of Allah, I did start praying straight away. Not all the prayers, um, Allah, Allah forgive us, Um, but gradually two, three And I was so excited that I just used to ask the girls, come here and feel this. Oh, my God. Say Allahu Akbar. See how that feels. And so we discussed the 
you know, we had that kind of environment um, because I'm a, a journalist, because I'm an actor. We were able to kind of, we pretty much workshopped Islam a little bit about how we were going to live it. So they joined me in praying re- really quickly and they said straight away, we love Islam. We, we get it. So Jesus is, so Jesus is a prophet. Muhammad's a prophet. We're going to learn about him. And there's only one God. What's the problem? That's not the same if you coming from an atheist background. So alhamdulillah, we did have a bit of cushioning in the household for that. Are your children Muslims now or? One is very much so. And the other is on her path is what we can best say. And, you know, as with any parent, when a child goes in a very different direction to what you're hoping for, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, it sends ripples throughout the family. And um, yeah, so that so that happened. I think you know, but I have to say that in these days, um, convert or not, if, even if you've got seven kids and you're living in London, if one of them is praying at the age of seventeen, you know you've had a win. I mean, that's what I'm hearing about the reality on the ground, Subhanallah. So by the grace of Allah, so far, what I've got, I'm, I'm a convert with a child who prays and loves Allah, and that's a huge win. I'm so grateful. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. This, you know, it's a, it's a great blessing, um, and like you said, it's not just a challenge for for converts. Amanda, you've said before that your children are adults, Mashallah. So what were your experiences? So yeah, Mashallah, my children are. Well, adults in the sense that they're young, they're young men now, mashallah, they're 20, 22 and 18. And they're both in higher education at the moment. And alhamdulillah, and I have to say, I don't think this was down to me at all. I, it's purely Allah's hidayah. They're both practicing Muslims. And when I say I don't think it was down to me at all, it's because I did put in my best effort. I mean, I uh, had my older son quite soon after officially converting. I think I've been Muslim about two years when I had my older son. And I didn't know much, in all honesty. I mean, I think I had done my research. I I came to Islam from a very intellectually informed point of view, in that I had done a lot of reading and a lot of research and so on. Um, But when it came down to it, I, you know, I hadn't thought about how am I going to raise Muslim children. And in hindsight, I wish I had looked at it more. I wish I had thought more about how am I going to teach them to pray? How am I going to teach them the Quran if I don't know myself? How am I going to ensure that they feel Muslim in their identity? So really, I just sort of, I I winged it for the better part of their (laughs) younger years. There were a few things that I did, which I was quite strict about, uh, which nowadays, in all honesty, I'm not sure you could get away with. I didn't let them participate in any religious education at school. They were normal state schools. Um, I couldn't afford private schooling for them. So I didn't allow them to participate in RE. They didn't do any of the assemblies unless they were generic assemblies. They Anything about Christmas, Easter, they were not participating at all. And they didn't miss it. It was quite interesting because they didn't miss it at all. And they didn't, they never once asked me, why can't we do Christmas? Why can't we do Easter? Our friends are doing it. Alhamdulillah, I have to say that I was really blessed in that aspect in that I never had to you know, I never had to do anything that they felt they were missing out. Um, and I understand that that's a massive concern for a lot of parents nowadays. They think, you know, oh, our kids are going to miss out. They're going to feel different from their friends. Alhamdulillah, my kids never felt that way. But I still would have, I would have preferred to give them a more Islamic environment, I think, in terms of outside of the home. That would have been really nice. But alhamdulillah, it didn't happen, you know. But I think I could have planned a bit better how I was going to educate them. You know, their 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 tarbiya, as you say. Um, I'm not even sure how you translate that word. Their education, their training. Oh, I was going to jump in actually. We, we yeah. were just say, say, saying that I completely understand mm-hmm. about the uh, having not having a plan. Uh, many of us who come to Islam, you know, the sisters were single mums, yeah. and so we're just planning for like the disaster of the day to get through it alive and to have done our prayers is like yes whereas you know um more f- families with with more support in them and larger kind of uh relatives around them they can say oh we go to madrasa every weekend and really push for that whereas i think as a white english mum I don't think mm. color matters actually let's just say a uh, british uh, you know from a, a, a non-heritage muslim background that to push kids into madrasa 
boy, you're already battling with your in-laws, with your former in-laws. You're, you've already got an ex who probably hates Islam. And so I think we sit back a lot um, and we don't kind of, you know, propel our, our children forward as perhaps we do in other areas. So, yeah, our kids excel. They can be runners. They can be they can be dra- drum, do drama shows if we go in that direction. But taking them to madrasa every week, that seems extreme. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, in all honesty, even though my children were born after I converted and their father was, well, is a heritage Muslim himself, the thought never crossed our mind to send them to Madrasa at the mosque. Um, And I know that we've said we'll talk about this topic a little bit later, but let's bring it in now because I had friends who were also converts who had children who were of mixed ethnic backgrounds whose kids were bullied at Madrasa. They were really treated horribly at Madrasas. And these are people who are now in their 20s and 30s and who you know, they, they, they carry, I don't want to say trauma, I don't want to sound overly dramatic, but it is trauma. Bullying does cause young children trauma. And they, they carry like, they've had to relearn their relationship with the Quran and with Islam itself because of how they were treated by people at Madrasa, which is really very, very sad because ostensibly you send your kids there to learn. And they didn't learn. And most of it was racism of some form or another. Most of it was, you know, if the kids looked white, then it was like, oh, you're, you know, they would they would use terms in whatever the community language was that were slightly derogatory towards white people. Um, if they were, if they didn't look white, if they looked, say, if if they looked Afro-Caribbean or anything like that, then it was other racist terms. Um, If they looked Asian, but weren't from, uh, like, didn't speak the community language, it was a whole other thing. So, you know, I just sort of, uh, that was one thing that I did make a conscious decision about was I'm not putting my children in that. I also sort sort of naively thought that because my children's father was an Arabic speaker, that he would teach them, which of course he didn't, um, because he was too busy trying to figure out English to, you know, finish studying and make a living and so on. So he, you know, never sat them down and taught them Arabic. So they did lose out in that respect. Um, Sheikh Bilal, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it's, I wouldn't, you know, advise anyone to put their children into Madrasa without, you know, checking it out first. I won't even put my children, you know, into some Madrasas. Alhamdulillah, the mosque that is near our house is quite diverse. So you get a mix of different Muslims, different cultures and different colours. So they're a bit more comfortable with it. You know, there are those challenges. Uh, but mashallah, my, your, your children are still quite young, aren't they? Yeah, my children are still young and they were all born into to Islam after me and my wife converted. So, but still, you know, the, even at school, they, all, they were all at religious school uh, at the assistance of my wife. Because I was like, no, just put them in normal state school. I went there and I, <laughs> I'm a Muslim. So they're going to have to learn how to deal with living mm. around you know in a non-muslim community but my wife insisted in putting them in uh, religious school uh, so they're in a uh, okay. religious primary and, and secondary schools now and um, they've experienced uh, a bit of racism or prejudice maybe there or being called converts when they're not <laughs> not converts they're thinking why are they seeing us as converts you, you, you know my mum and dad they're the converts not me mm. you know, so, so, so there is that is challenging the racism is really a problem so my eldest daughter Alex was really enthusiastic and, and I, I want to go through a few things that that, that really uh, that did work for me and can work we had um, a wonderful young Ustad who came and taught the girls um, when I didn't have a car just for about three months and it turn them around they were so full of like oh, Musa alayhi salam and as the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and I didn't even know sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I'm like what 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 is going on and all I heard was them laughing and chatting you know we're in the same room it was wonderful wonderful learning um not everybody has access to that I realize that but that really really it does help having somebody else of expertise that that that, that definitely did help so my eldest daughter got really enthusiastic about you know, um, being a part of Muslim clubs. She went to a very um, English private school in Manchester. She got a scholarship, mashallah, and she wanted to join the uh, Islamic society there. 
And so she said, well, look, we're not doing Juma on a Friday. Let's do a Juma. And so the first Friday she turned up and there was one girl, two girls there. And the second Friday there was one girl there. And the third Friday there was no, no girls there. On the fourth Friday, she went to the room next door. All of the Asian girls were praying Juma without her. It was it was so painful. She had no white British friends because all the girls in the school rejected her because she was in hijab. And then you've got this kind of cultish, cliqueishness going on, and they rejected her as well. And I did some tearful praying to Allah for about wallahi six years. Oh Allah, give this child good friends. Oh Allah, please don't deny her friends from this ummah. And honestly, I remember, you know, sometimes as a mom, you you always blame your child, especially if it's a girl, I think, because you want to, there's an instinct like, well, have you tried this? <clears throat> Not blaming, but advising, over advising. So have you tried this? It can sound like you're saying I'm doing something wrong. So I was kind of framing it like, well, maybe you didn't do this until there was a parent's evening. And I went to the parents' evening and everybody's got their champagne in their hands. I'm like, I'm really not going to stay here long. This is not where I should be. And then I see, yay, some sisters in the corner in hijab. I'm like, saved, we can go outside. They said, salam alaikum, where are you from? I said, I'm a Londoner. They turned away and blanked me. And I'm like, these are the parents who are blanking my daughter. And I felt horrible. And in that moment I thought this for me is 10 minutes this for my daughter is six years and so honestly I get really choked uh, you know that is a hardship that Allah really really tests our young with and I'm so so thankful to Allah to tell you that now at 21 is the first time my daughter has had friends as a Muslim. And she's been Muslim 12 years. Alhamdulillah. She just went away to Bosnia with um, five wonderful Muslim girls from all backgrounds and, and really is like shining and growing. But it's terrifying because if the mainstream Muslim ummah don't, you know, put their arms around these kids, too many get lost and yeah, give up. It's a really, really horrible uh, experience that actually in you know, when we come into the religion, we expect, you know, so much more from our, our community. Yeah, the, the, the issue of friendship, subhanAllah. I, when my kids were in high school and we were living in Wales, another city in Wales, not in Cardiff, and my older son, he had he was friends with a few Muslim boys, but these were not boys I would want my son to be friends with. They were Muslim culturally, if you get what I mean. And then, subhanAllah, he became really good friends with a young uh, Polish boy. And I have to say, culturally speaking, mashallah, this young boy, may Allah give him hidayah, was more Islamic in his upbringing than a lot of these other boys had been. And I don't want to say where they were from, but, you know, and it really struck me how important friendship is because he would tell me about his friend and he would say, you know, oh, he, he doesn't hang around after school because he has to go home and help his mom with the housework. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't come out on weekends because he's helping his parents with their restaurant and things like this. And, and I mean, I met this young man and he was very polite, excellent manners, you know, his, he clearly was being raised with a good set of morals and ethics, which these other boys were not. And all of these other boys, you know, Muslims were running around having girlfriends and all of that stuff. And I thought to myself, like you said, Lauren, at the start, subhanAllah, if you've got one child at the age of 17 who's praying and, you know, if their girl's wearing hijab and so on, alhamdulillah, you know, and I've, I've seen this with my own eyes and it is very, very frightening. And But it makes me think, you know, we can't all afford to send our children to Islamic schools. And if we are new to Islam ourselves, how can we instill in our children these Islamic values. Now you were saying, you know, what's worked for you, you had somebody come in and teach, but are there other ideas that have worked or other suggestions? Maybe Sheikh, you have some suggestions for people if they're facing these dilemmas. I think it's very challenging because, um, you know, the Islamic schools that are out there, I've worked in one and I'm affiliated to two that are in my local area. And, um, you know, they're not perfect. And there are, some of them are quite poor actually. And I wouldn't advise people to send their children there. So, you know, it is it is very challenging. I think um, if you are going to do that, then really do a lot of research. 
don't just throw them in an Islamic school and think, you know, it's everything's going to be perfect there. Really, really do a lot of research and speak to other parents and get reviews from other parents that before you you go and do that. It's challenging. It's challenging in, you know, we convert to Islam and we're learning ourselves. And this is, you know, a massive, massive challenge for us. What Lauren, what do you think? Well, I was just thinking that actually one of the one of the big challenges is this thing that um Muslim converts are always seen as over the top. And um, because our experience, right, is that you've lived through dunya, Allah has saved you from the fire and literally you feel a hand has pulled you back and you're so grateful you'll do anything. Night prayers, I'm doing it. Fasting, we're doing it. Don't speak to that. Don't play that record. You know, we're we're really, we are full of joy and um, abundance and enthusiasm. And that's very off-putting in hindsight. Of course, I get, I, I, I understand a bit more now that if you've grown up you have a softly softly approach and you've let you you've let things go that shouldn't be let go of you've adopted things that shouldn't be adopted but you've also learned to live in a realistic balance as as well um whereas whereas we're still on the on the uh, roller coaster so I do think that for integration of our children and as a family that that is difficult um I would say what what did work sis is um Find, really work hard and find a masjid where you can make friends. Um, don't presume the kids will make friends on their own. Don't, like Sheikh said, don't presume that the groups you put them in are going to have really sensible ideas because they may have wacko ideas. And that, and also the kids may not be practicing at all at home. They're just practicing one 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 hour a week at the, at the club that you're sending them to. So really, but making friends, I think, Alhamdulillah, making friends is vital. I think it took me six years to kind of get the hang of that and really invite people around to my house and be able to go around to people's houses. And actually, that is so, so important. It's going to be the friendship group that you create yourself that's going to support you and your kids. Yeah, I think that is, you've hit the nail on the head. If we as converts ourselves don't have strong friendship networks, how, how are we ever going to engender that for our children? And one of the things that I've actually sort of gotten involved with, and I think I've talked about this before, was we used to run a halakha for new Muslim sisters at the mosque. And all of that shut down in COVID, subhanAllah, inshallah, it'll start up again. But we noticed like there was this disproportionate number of single mothers coming in. And some of them with children that had been born after they had converted, some before they had converted, but all of these women were really learning the bare basics. And they had, you know, six, seven, eight, up to 12 year old children who didn't have a clue. They didn't know what it meant to be Muslim. So we thought, well, their moms are coming in. Let's do something for the kids at the same time. And I, you know, I can't emphasize how important that was that the kids got to know each other as well. You know, they were, they were the convert mom's kids, <laughs> basically. Uh, but it gave them that sense of community. And I think that's really important because if you haven't got any friends in school because you're the odd one out for whatever reason, any little community that you can develop is, is vital for you. You know, it, it keeps you grounded in that sense. And so I think it's important for our, you know, as converts, sometimes we need to do these things for ourselves. We need to make it ourselves. You know what, sis? The other thing, mm. the thing here, though, is that we stand accused of why are you breaking the ummah up into small parts? There's no such thing as a convert. Once you take your shahada, you're the same as the rest of us. Do you think you're better than us? Why are you for, you know, your children should be, are you racist? Sister, are you racist? Why don't you want to mix with Asians? Why don't you want to mix with Arabs? And so we get we get all that guilt trip as well. But I'm going to say right here, right now, that in the founding years, having one or two friends who are convert Muslims, and inshallah, always make sure they know more than you do, because you don't want to be, if possible, if possible, but having go to that revert group, you know, get to know those reverts, and then you'll have confidence and comfort in your deen and in your society enough to make other friends. What do you guys think of that? I've had the accusations thrown at me. Um, you know, why are you why are you creating a, a, a division? Why are you making something separate for converts? And my answer to that is simple. Anybody who migrates to another country 
seeks out people from their own country while they're learning the culture of the home of the host country. Everybody does that. Now, a convert has made hijra to Allah and is trying to navigate the lay of the land. They will naturally seek out people who have done it before them to learn from them. It's not about making divisions. It's about supporting new Muslims in order to give them the tools that they need to join the, the mainstream Muslim community, as it were, to help them navigate that, to learn the new ways of doing things that they don't necessarily know, and to learn it in a context that they will understand. That's how I usually answer that question. I mean, you see mosques until today, four generations, five generations in, until today, we've got Pakistani mosques, Bengali mosques, Somali mosques. So why not have a halakha for converts? I don't mm-hmm. think that it's, I don't think it's rocket science, but what about you, Sheikh Bilal? Does New Beginnings ever get this sort of thing asked? Yeah, yeah, we, we have um, people who do comment on, you know, why are you keeping it all separate for, for converts? And But the end goal is obviously full integration into the wider Muslim community. So, you know, definitely for the early period of a convert's journey after conversion, they need to have that space where they can feel comfortable. They can be themselves. They don't have to worry about being judged by others. They're in an environment and amongst the community that they can relate easily to, to others as well without having the fear of facing any type of prejudice. So it is, you know, extremely important that we provide that service. And, you know, the ultimate goal is wider integration into the community. But that that takes time. So that's the community aspect. But if I was listening to this podcast, I'd be going, but how do I get them to pray? (laughs) Or how do I, what about modesty? Uh, what about family? So there's, uh, I think there's, there's three biggies here, isn't there? There's, there's probably many more, but I'm going to throw out my, my three biggies were dress code, um, the actual praying and fasting, and then the ex fam, the, the, the non-Muslim family. So uh, I'll start with the non-Muslim family. It was, it was funny because I've got kind of a liberal sort of like understanding everybody should be respected sort of family. And then you find little kind of schisms that the Islam is scary. Islam scares people because of what, what they've been told on the media. And, you know, I had that in myself before I, when I started coming to Islam. I'm like, oh, oh, I have this prejudice. Oh, OK. I didn't know I felt like that, but I do. So I kind of understood that with my family. I'll give you an example. I remember one Friday night, my girls were about 13 and 15. And my mum had only ever seen them for ages in abayas and hijabs because they were nipping in and nipping out of her house. But they say we stayed over this night. And um, so she she saw them as young women. She saw she saw them, you know, without the hijab. And she's like, oh, my mum was a mo- my mum used to be a model and an actor. So she said, oh, my God, what beauties they are. Aren't they gorgeous? Oh, girls, you should be out with the boys tonight, not in being boring. Look at you, what fun you could be having. And I'm just, I walked out the room and thought, oh, my God. Do you know how hard it is to actually, you know, I'm thinking, oh, no. I remember standing in her kitchen holding the countertop going, breathe, breathe. You know, Allah, give me the right words to say. And then my mum came in behind me and she said, I can tell by your shoulders you're thinking something. <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, I was thinking that out that window, about two miles down the road is the Pink Pussycat, which was a club you used to take me to when I was 15. Do you remember? Oh, I remember Pink Pussycat. Oh, we did have a laugh. I said, yeah. All the, all the men I used to get involved with and the drinking we used to do. I said, yeah, just think Holly and Alex could be there now, beautiful as they are. You know, they could be with those men, couldn't they? They could be coming home drunk and vomiting. You're right, they're missing out. And there was a pause. My mum said, God, it would be awful, wouldn't it, to think of those awful men touching those beautiful younger... Oh, God. She said, do you know... And then there was another pause. She said, you know what? I actually think they're better off as they are now. Imagine young women being in on a Friday night visiting their grandmother. I'm like... Because that's Islam. That's get it. That's that's what we give to our young people. So that was kind of a, a, a big victory. Explaining it, getting our families on board is so vital. That's really an amazing story because I think your your mother probably was well meaning when she's complimenting your daughters, but then she's it, you know, she needed to take that pause to think what exactly is she saying? What is what exactly is she suggesting for them? And I think that this is a challenge. I mean, whether our children have 
one set of grandparents being not Muslim or both sets of grandparents being not Muslim, we all have non-Muslim family members that our children will have to learn to interact with and to respect and yet to keep boundaries with and so on. But what do we do if they're, if our families or our non-Muslim families, and sometimes this is one of our children's parents, are actively opposed to our children being Muslim. How can we tackle that? I mean, I understand what you were saying, Lauren, about praying. That is absolutely an essential life skill that we need to teach to our kids. But, you know, we can teach them how to pray and we can set them the example of being somebody who prays, which I think is one of the best ways. But then if they've got a grandparent or a parent telling them, what are you doing? I just want for us to give a moment to all of our lovely brothers and sisters out there who might be really struggling with this right now, who might be crying because all of the work that you do for Allah to Allah with those kids during the week, at the weekends when they're with the other parent is completely and often deliberately and often malignantly undone. Um, I've, I've certainly experienced that. I see, you know, the children were in a no smoking, no drinking environment then people, you know, minute my daughter turns 16, do you want a glass of wine? Do you want a beer? Oh, don't be so straight laced. And that is, that is unbelievably pain. I didn't know I could feel that, that pain. That was a new, fresh horror. That was a new, fresh test that you're working so hard and giving them ethics. And then, you know, you're hearing on the grapevine at the weekend, one of, you know, the kids are out partying and they won't speak to you anymore because the other family are working against you. You know, wallahi, I don't have an answer to that. I went through it and I just really sink to your knees, get it, get up in the night and pray and try, try as hard as you can to let them feel the positivity of being back at home. Yes, Dunya may get them because it got all of us at the end of the day. It's a real trial, but just give them some difference to come home to. Uh, I don't know. I, I it really, it still upsets me, to be honest. It's a tough one. And it, it is a tough one. And for me, you know, sisters have come to me and it's not as easy as just setting a boundary or don't let them go into that environment because sometimes it's it's their other parent. Sometimes it's their father. He has legal rights. You can't alienate them and, and nor should you. You know, and you do your best setting an example, but what you said, get up in the night and pray. You know, the dua of the mother, the prayers of the mother for her child are so powerful. And I also point out that, you know, my parents, and, you know, may Allah give them hidayah, my parents did their best raising me as a non Muslim, and I still ended up as a Muslim. Alhamdulillah. So, I mean, it, it is clearly in Allah's hands whether we end up as Muslims or not. We set the best example we can set. We make dua and we leave it in his hands, you know, and it is hard. And obviously, if there's anybody out there listening and you have concerns about this and you want to talk to anybody about this, do get in touch with New Beginnings because that's why we're here. We're here to help and to support each other with this. Sheikh Bilal, did you have anything you wanted to add to this? Yeah, it's, you know, I don't have the answer to this. as I haven't been through it personally, but I do know, you know, brothers and sisters where, the other families might be giving the children pork on the weekends or taking them to church and there's a clash. And like you said, it's in Allah's hands. I always try to think that way, you know, ultimately it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree. Uh, somebody could, you know, have all the Muslim influence and all the Islamic influence and still not accept Islam. And, but then I look at myself he was brought up with nothing, no, no influence about Islam, and Alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm here. Uh, you know, sometimes me and my wife, we, we have this as well. Like she'll be on the kids, like pray and wear hijab, and surprisingly, I'm not like that. I think you know, if my my daughters want to wear hijab. I'm not going to say anything. It, I'm just going to lead them to it and let them make that that choice. So I don't get on their backs about, about anything and. My eldest, she doesn't really, she doesn't really go out, but she's not really interested in wearing hijab and, and stuff. Uh, but my middle child, she just started putting it on without us saying anything to her. <laughs> she just started wearing it of uh, her own volition. Uh, so they will have their own personalities as well, and they'll have their own decisions to make. That's my approach. Anyway, I'm quite a liberal uh, parent, but my wife is probably a bit, <laughs> a bit more. <laughs> But don't, but I wonder, Sheikh, um, the, the, 
the letting them find it for themselves is really risky, isn't it? Because, you know, what once the, the girls hit their, you know, let's just talk about the girls, their puberty, and they're not in hijab, every minute is a sin that they're outside. So uh, aren't we failing them by not saying, put this on for your own sake, and when you're older, it's your choice? What do you, you know, isn't that too risky? I think um, then they might not be sincere in doing it. And I want them to be sincere, to do it out of sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's that's my view. And not that they feel pressured into, into doing it. You know, they're going to have to make their own choices anyway when they're, they're old enough. My girls are still fairly young anyway, so maybe when they start getting older, I might get <laughs> a, bit, a bit stricter about it. I, I think, too, there's a fine line between encouragement and enforcement. And I've seen a lot of parents, convert and otherwise, who enforce Islam in the household and on their children. And it I, I, I don't have any statistics, but I'm going to say nine times out of 10, it backfires. Nine times out of 10, at some point, the child rebels because they see everything around them that looks so shiny and fun and exciting, and they want to try it out. And with enforcement, what are we enforcing? We're enforcing dogma and we're enforcing rules, but we're often lacking the spirit behind it. To my mind, it's much better. And I'm saying this because I, you know, I realize how many mistakes I made in raising my own kids with this in this respect. If we are instead of enforcing, if we are encouraging, and the encouraging is coming from a place of desire to please our creator, desire to please Allah a desire to emulate the example of the prophet, peace be upon him, um, a desire to draw closer to Allah, then it's much more encouraging for children to see that and to understand that. And then they want to do that too, because they want to love Allah too. They want to love Rasulullah as well. Whereas if it's imposed, you know, I, I think if we worry too much about whether or not it's a sin, then that will become our focus is that haram, haram, haram. And we all know what that what that leads to, Right. Rather than worrying about if what they're doing is haram, let's worry about making them love doing the acts of worship. Um, I think we need to show them a lot of love mm. and have an open um, relationship with them where they feel they can trust us and come to us with, with anything. I'm more concerned about their character, to be honest with you, rather about the, those things like hijab and praying. You know, if I hear my daughters telling a lie or using foul language or behaving badly, that will... It really annoyed me much more than, than not wearing hijab or missing press, to be honest with you. I'm more concerned about those things. And this is the interesting thing. What makes up character, right? Because we, we, we have this wonderful outline of the Prophet wasallam about how to behave and be an ideal person or even be on the road to being a pretty good person um, with a view to getting into Jannah and pleasing um, for the pleasure of Allah Ta'ala. And sorry, are you getting the Yadhan here? Are you? Shall I I'll just nice. be quiet? <laughs> so I was just saying that that again, even, even, even um, you know, talking to them about um, being punctual, saying please and thank you, but being, being respectful to older, to older people still sets them apart from the mainstream. It's still in this day and age, really sadly, because I don't think it would have, would have been such a problem in the 70s with British manners, to be quite honest, you know, um, it, they wouldn't have been so weird. When you're talking about, you know, character and their ethics and their manners and so on, and this idea of, you know, are we imposing faith on them or are we encouraging them in faith? To me, this is nothing, to, this isn't even a convert issue as such. And I'm saying this because obviously I was married to somebody who was a heritage Muslim and he, his approach was enforcing, enforcing the faith. And I mean, my kids, alhamdulillah, so far seem to have turned out okay. But I'm just thinking of other people in that extended family who none of them are converts. They all have the same ethnic background. They all have the same educational background, more or less. How many of them have children who are completely off the rails, sadly? and it's mainly because the religion was enforced in the house. I'm not going to say it's because it's all in Allah's hands, but, you know, enforcing the religion, forcing the kids to do things didn't work. And sometimes as converts, we can take a little bit more of a liberal approach because we think, well, we were guided to Islam, alhamdulillah, despite our upbringing. We want to leave it up to our kids to choose as well. But then 
our spouse, if we married, you know, if we're married to, to a heritage Muslim, might have very different ideas of what child rearing should be. And then that can cause clashes as well. You know, so there's there's so many different things to navigate. Any of any advice on how uh, a couple of tips on perhaps for people who are in these a relationship with a heritage Muslim and a convert and, and bringing up kids and finding that middle path? Having experienced it myself, I do not have any advice because I did it wrong. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> one, one thing that I did learn is that if you are a new convert or fairly new to Islam and you are not married yet, Think very deeply about how you want to educate your future children, inshallah, and marry somebody who's on board with them. And, you know, you're, when, when people get married too often, people get married, number one, they get married too quickly after converting, and they marry somebody who's not really compatible with them for whatever reason, or they don't think long term when they're getting married. They, they get married because, you know, let's be honest, they get married because they fancy somebody, Right. And that's, you know, that's nice. It's, 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 it's adorable and all of that, but it's not necessarily good for the long term. If you haven't had your children yet and you are thinking about getting married, find yourself a spouse, whether male or female, find your, find your spouse who you will trust to raise your children as you want them raised if you die before you finish raising them. Interestingly, you know? the, fir- the first duty of a Muslim parent is to choose the parent of their children. So, sorry, the first duty of, of, of a Muslim mother or father to the Muslim child is to choose their, the other parent. I was never taught that. Nobody told me that when they were telling me to get married. They told me, here's a nice man. He's Muslim. Marry him. That's your compatibility. SubhanAllah. Sheikh Bilal, what do you think of these issues? Yeah, I think. I mean, does. interestingly, you're married to a, to a convert sister, mashallah. So it's different again, isn't it? Yeah, my, my situation's much different. Um, so, you know, so we got married and, you know, we didn't even think about children or have any discussions about how we're going to raise children. So I think if you're already married, then uh, I think definitely start having conversations uh, and planning and how you're going to, to deal with these issues and challenges and, and raise your children. And if you're not, then definitely what Amanda said is excellent advice. Sister Lauren, what about in somebody who's in the same situation that you were in where they're coming to Islam and they already have children, single parents, for example, what, what would you advise for them in hindsight? I mean, in, in hindsight, I, th- I think we've, we've, we've raised a couple of good issues here. Make those friendship groups within the new community. Don't think so much about going to organizations. Don't think that, you know, the, the kids are going to get their dean from some magical, you know, wonderful, beautiful, perfectly formed uh, group or club. It's going to be good friendships with sisters who are, you know, in the dean no more than you and have children of their own and it's household to household. I would say if, if that that's the really big thing, see yourself as not part of a wide community, but uh, have you got three households who you enter to, you have around your home and whose home, because they're really the replacement family and they're really the extended family for your children. And, they, and these sisters or brothers, they will really see you through and you can help them in the, in the, in the times of struggle. Um, again, don't be afraid of making convert friends. I have to say, I think I had a little bit of the syndrome of, of being a bit suspicious of other converts, like, well, wh- well, I know nothing about Islam, so you probably know nothing. So I daren't be friends with you. I need to go to a real Muslim. I think there is a little bit of that. If you can drop that early on, that's really, really useful because um, it's most definitely not the case. And, uh, you know, and try to work with the family as much as you can. Let them realize the good that the kids are having by seeing the change in you. And, um, you know, yes, for encouraging the children, but talk about Islam all the time. Don't make it another subject like a school subject. Today is Friday, so we're going to do 15 minutes of X because, uh, you know, otherwise, if school worked like that, they'd only need to go to school 15 minutes. Islam is a lived experience. You know, try a hadith a week or here's a fun thing. Jumma, we're going to go and we're going to do something amazing because the prophet did this. Make it something living and livable, inshallah. I love that, mashallah. Islam is a lived experience. It's it's 24-7. We should try try to embody it as much as we can in our lives. Uh, look, Bismillah, I know I'm the guest on your show, but as um, you know, somebody who's habitually a journalist, I feel I have to do the wrap up today. Will you will you please allow me to do that, Sheikh? 
and Amanda. You have my permission, my ijazah. <laughs> MashaAllah, Allah. Uh, well, I think, you know, we, we've kind of come to those points, haven't we, of, of agreement that it is about families around you. It is not about groups. Don't expect too much from the community you're entering and really embody the experience in day to day life. I would like to add to what you said as your conclusion is do not ever underestimate the powers of your dua as a parent for your child. Don't give up making them. If you see your child as being a good Muslim, get on your knees, uh, face to the floor. Thank Allah. If you see your child going off the rails a bit, same thing and beg Allah to guide them as well as setting a good example. You know, dua is, you know, very important. And you see in the Quran, even the prophets making dua for their progeny and dua for their children that they're, they're brought up in Islam. And those are the prophets. And, you know, that, that's our example. And sometimes we have to realize that not everything is in our control, that no matter how hard we try, you know, uh, our children might not choose Islam. Again, children of the prophets, Noah and others, they didn't choose Islam, you know, so who are we? So not everything is in our hands. We try our best, try to show our children as much love as possible and uh, instill love for the religion in their hearts as much as possible. And we leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, that's it for another episode of the New Beginnings podcast. Please do share and subscribe. We're on all major plod- podcasts. Oh, I blew it. Look at that. You see how Allah tests you. See, you see, when you're not humble, you will be humble. Look at that. I came in with that. I'm a journalist thing. Allahu Akbar. Good. I'm glad that happened. I'm going to try again. Please do share and subscribe. So we're on all major podcast platforms. And inshallah, we'll see you next time. Amanda? Sadly, once again, we've come to the end of our time. If anybody has been affected by what we've been talking about, don't hesitate to get in touch with New Beginnings. Thanks for Lauren for joining us and taking out our time all the way from Turkey. And for and for letting us hear the Adhan from all the way over there as well, mashallah. That's it for another episode of the New Beginnings podcast. We do hope you enjoyed this episode. Please share on social media and with family and friends. Yes, please do share and subscribe. We're on all major podcast platforms. Inshallah, we'll see you next time. I look forward to it. But for now, thank you for listening. Until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.